Hi everyone, welcome to Simple Life Strategies TV. I'm Zoe B and today I have with me David Mitchie. David is an internationally renowned author and he's written the best-selling books Enlightenment on the Go and Buddhism for Busy People. And today he's going to be talking to us about a really interesting book called The Dalai Lama's Cat. So if you're like me and you are absolutely 100% passionate about the Dalai Lama and you're crazy about cats, then this is going to be the interview for you to watch. Welcome, David. Hi, Zoe. Thank you very much for having me on your program. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So I've got to ask, the first question is, does the Dalai Lama really have a cat? Well, the answer to that is very simple. At the moment, no, he does not. Oh. But in the past, he certainly has. <laughs> um, he's made a comment recently about how there's too much attachment formed when we have pets. Um, plus, I would guess that he does so much traveling, uh, he probably doesn't want to have a little furry being to have to leave uh, at home every, every week while he travels the world. Um, so, no, he doesn't right now, but he has in the past. And in fact, if you go online, there's some beautiful pictures of him holding a little cat in a window. I'm not sure whether it was his cat, but it was mm -hmm. certainly a cat. And the Dalai Lama, of course, is very, very fond of domestic animals. Oh, wonderful. Because <laughs> it's kind of that, you know, you wouldn't imagine that he would have a pet, would you? It's quite a, an interesting um, idea that he would Well, have. people don't think about it, but, uh, you know, um, the Dalai Lama and the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury, the, you know, all these spiritual leaders there, regular normal people who have come, many of them, from regular lives. The Dalai Lama, of course, has had a very unusual life uh, from a very young age. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's not. It's certainly not um, beyond the bounds of possibility that they would all have pets. And it's kind of interesting to think, you know, what an amazing experience those animals would have um, being the kind of companions of those people and the, the interesting people that would come through their lives on an almost daily, if not weekly, basis. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the concept behind the book. So it's through the, the lens of um, the Dalai Lama's cat, is that right? That's right. The book is written by His Holiness's cat, HHC. Uh, that's her official name. She's a cat of many, many names. You know, we tend to give many names to those that we love, uh, and HHC is no different. That's her official name at the Dalai Lama, for example, calls her Snow Lion. And down at the, the cafe, where she spends a lot of time, the Himalaya Book Cafe, She's known as Rinpoche, and Rinpoche is a uh, typically used in Tibetan Buddhism. It's a form of endearment and respect. Uh, it means precious in Tibetan, and it's normally applied to lamas. So we, we have a lama at our, in our Buddhist society called Rinpoche, but she's called Rinpoche because she's very, very precious. Um, so she's a cat of many names, um, and yeah, the book is written by her, and uh, it really, I guess, came around because I was, you know, I've, I've always been crazy about all animals until I was about 16, in fact, I wanted to be a vet. Um, and the very first memories I have are sort of waking up and seeing this charcoal face in mine, um, which was our Siamese. Um, my parents bought a Siamese cat for my brother when I was born, so I wouldn't be so jealous of the, he wouldn't be so jealous of the baby. But in fact, the cat wanted to spend more time with me, I guess, because I, was, I wasn't going to squirm and move. Um, I know people these days are very kind of, you can't let cats near the crib, but that wasn't the case with me. Um, so I've always been very, very close to cats uh, mm -hmm. and all animals. Um, and uh, we had this beautiful little um, Himalayan cat called Princess Wasikar Saud of the Sapphire Throne, um, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, but I was quite, quite potty about little Wasik. Um, and one day I heard that the Dalai Lama had had a cat. And that's when I got to think just what I've been saying a moment ago. Wouldn't it be amazing um, if that cat could actually speak and tell his or her story um, mm -hmm. uh, about all the people that she meets that comes to see the Dalai Lama and all the things that he says and the wisdom that gets shared, etc. plus all the cat-like little adventures that cats have. Um, and that was the inspiration, really, for the Dalai Lama's cat. Um, so it's, it's a book written by her. It's about how she gets rescued. I won't, I won't spoil it by telling you more, but the Dalai Lama rescues her. And she goes to live with him and uh, discovers a whole lot of things about Tibetan Buddhism. It, and what I've tried to do really is like if embed a number of Tibetan Buddhist messages in a book, in a book which I hope is very kind of playful, lighthearted and warm and fuzzy. But nonetheless, it's got some fairly profound and meaningful messages in there. Yeah, and I can testament to that. You definitely delivered for that one. Um, and before we get into um, a, little, a few more of the stories from the book, I'd just be really keen to hear a little bit about your creative process. Like when, as an author and as a creative person, I'd imagine you have lots of, um, you know, ideas about books. Like how do you decide 
to narrow that down to one book what is there like a defining moment like for example with this book like did you suddenly have an aha moment where you were like I have to write this book how does it work for you it's funny that you should ask that because um, that's exactly how it happens for me. I need to have that aha moment because, um, as you say, one can sit there with a whole lot of vague ideas about books. I mean, just last weekend, I sat down with a blank piece of paper and a pen and I wrote, wrote down the titles of nine books that I could write. They just kind of, they're, they're swirling around in my mind in the ether. Uh, who knows? <laughs> One or none of them might be written. Um, but you really need to have something that really in, it energizes that process. Mm -hmm. And I'd had the idea about a Dalai Lama cat book for quite some time. In mm -hmm. fact, initially I was thinking of doing it as a photographic treatment. Because, you know, there's so many mm -hmm. images with cats and, and little aphorisms or sayings, etc., which I now actually use a lot on my Facebook page to promote the Dalai Lama's cat. Um, and I just thought that was my initial point. But I was struggling with the narrative voice for His Holiness's Cat, mm -hmm. which is barking mad, if you excuse the metaphor, because basically, <laughs> basically, um, I was, I, I can still vividly remember one Saturday morning, I was sitting meditating, um, of course, had no wish to think about books at all, but the, pop, the thought suddenly popped into my mind, why not write the book as though it's little Wasik speaking, my own cat speaking, because of course, I had a very clear idea about how she would sound if she spoke. Yeah. You know, because um, I'm you know so close to her, and at that point it all just gelled for me. Cause I thought this is easy. I can just write the books like as though I'm my own cat. Um, and so I literally got up from that meditation session and I wrote the first couple of chapters that weekend because it just all flowed from there. Once once I got that narrative voice, uh, that was like the the key that that uh, opened the lock. Um, and uh, I know I'm not alone in that, in, in that many authors have different things, mm -hmm. different ways in which these these things come together, but whether it's a narrative voice or a particular scene or uh, a particular character that they just become passionate about, we all need to find our sort of way of entering into the story. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you did sort of have that aha moment around how, um, how her personality would come through in that character. Exactly, because it's so, it would be so easy to write a very haughty, um, you know, bitchy, cat-like sort of uh, approach, but that would be totally out of keeping with the Dalai Lama. So, you know, you've got to get the balance right. It's so critical. Yeah, that's true. Now, one of my favorite parts of the book is when um, little Snow Lion, that was my favorite name for her, <laughs> is um, she's overhearing a conversation between the Dalai Lama and a celebrity life coach. And I think he's he's at the top of his game at this point, this, this celebrity life coach. He's just made millions of dollars, he's selling out all of his shows, he's helped millions of people, yet he has this deep sense of unhappiness. And I thought that was such an interesting concept because, you know, as a coach myself, it's, you know, there seems to be this expectation that if you teach others or you help others in any way, then, you know, you've got your whole life figured out. And, you know, that's not really how it works. You know, we're, everyone, we're just human beings. So I thought that was really interesting, this concept of how on the outside people might look like everything's perfect and while on the inside that's not the case. And I myself have actually worked, you know, probably more recently to um, really show my truth and be a little bit more honest with my readers and the people that I connect with about what's going on for me because, you know, I'm not perfect and nor is anyone on the planet. Um, mm. And I actually even interviewed a Tibetan Buddhist monk about anger, and I asked him, um, "What, you know, do you get angry, Geshe La?" And he laughed at me. He thought it was absurd that I would even ask that question. And he said, "Yeah, of course. You know, I'm not free from suffering just because I'm a monk." So, I'd love to hear what inspired you to put that story in the book. You know, and just to hear your thoughts on that whole concept. Right. Well, it's a very um, pertinent question because, uh, and uh, several times you mentioned from the outside, but inside, yeah. and um, that dichotomy between our outer and inner is really important. And our problems as human beings is and always has been, uh, we tend to confuse the one for the other. And we tend to go in pursuit of the outer trappings. And we, we all have these inbuilt, inbuilt assumptions about what will make us happy. In fact, I've got an interesting book here, one of my favorites, um, by Daniel Gilbert, who's a prof of psychology at Harvard. Mm -hmm. It's called Stumbling on Happiness. And the title is Picture of a Banana Skin, um, deliberately, because we are very poor at predicting, in fact, what's going to make us happy. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our, our sort of the biggest... Um, 
superstitions, if you like, is making this connection between having all the external elements of our life in place and inner mm-hmm. happiness. Um, this kind of belief that if we uh, are living in the right suburb, in a beautiful home, and drive the right car, and have the right mm-hmm. clothes, socialize with the right people, are successful in our chosen career, um, have, have an adoring wife and beautiful family, um, these are all externals, okay? Um, if all these externals are in place, then we will be happy. And in fact, all the it goes against all our experience because we know that none of those things are true causes of happiness. A true yeah. cause of happiness being something which always works, just like um, a true cause of steam is applying heat to water. And it doesn't matter whether you apply the heat to the water or I do it, whether you do it in Australia or in Siberia or in the Sahara Desert, it doesn't matter how many times it's been done that day or that decade, it always works. That's a true cause. But for a true cause, what is a true cause of happiness? And many people, I mean, I would, I would invite anybody watching this to ask themselves that question, what is the true cause of happiness? Mm. Um, because wealth simply is not a true cause of happiness. I mean, we should all be, we all aware of that intellectually, but we still have this kind of default mode that I, I must have more. And if only I had so much more in my super fund or so whatever, you know, we're constantly aspiring for more, more, more. Um, and so in a way, um, our main problem is that we're focusing on, on getting the externals right the whole time rather than the internals right. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that one of the key messages in this book um, is that uh, instead of trying to focus on changing the world, it's more more, um, reliable, more useful to change the way that we experience the world. Um, cause that, and cause we got some, we got some say in that. There's a beautiful, uh, phrase by Shanti Deva, a Buddhist sage who once mm-hmm. said, I don't have enough leather to, ca- to cover the entire world to avoid stepping on thorns, but I do have enough to cover the soles of my feet. And mm-hmm. what he's meaning by that is that, you know, we can't control reality out there. You know, we can't control whether we, our business is going to go well or we're going to have a beautiful, adoring family, blah, blah, blah. We can't do all of that. We can do our best, but we can mm-hmm. try. We can't control it, but what we can control is the way we experience things. And so rather than investing so much of our time and energy on, on the external world, if you like, we should try and focus more on, on, on the way that we experience things. Um, and that takes us to the whole Buddhist path of mindfulness meditation uh, and, and changing mind training, if you like, which takes place over, over it's a lifetime's journey. And I guess that, that um, the thing about some life coaches, uh, not all, of course, because you know, life coaching is a huge spectrum, um, but some of them put so much emphasis on the externals. Mm-hmm. And it troubles me because basically, to me, all they're doing is sending people more effectively in the wrong direction. Um, rather than saying, actually, you know what, it doesn't really matter. Those things don't matter so much to your happiness as other things. And those other things are simple things that we can all do. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with you. I think that's such an interesting way of looking at it in that, you know, we, we can't control what happens outside of us, but we do have control of ourselves. And, you know, from my work, I'm quite passionate about, you know, I help people to identify what they're passionate about in life and, and what their life purpose is, I guess. But part of my process is that I always get them to look at how they tie that to a purpose that's bigger than themselves. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a beautiful Viktor Frankl quote, mm-hmm. which is in, um, uh, in one of my books. I can't remember which one, but it's a favorite quote of mine, which is that um, happiness cannot be pursued. It ensues as a side product of one's devotion to a cause greater than oneself. Yes. Uh, and I think that is so true. Um, when, we, when we think, you know, it's all about um, you know, me becoming the CEO, it's all about me getting $2 million in the bank or five million or whatever, when it's all about me, 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 um, that is not, um, we're not setting ourselves up for happiness with that view. Um, if, on the other hand, it's all about sharing the Dharma, you know, yeah. if you're a Buddhist person or um, helping wildlife, if that's what motivates you or, mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be, if it's a cause better, greater than oneself, then we're setting ourselves up for, for great happiness. Yeah. And I see that, you know, when I work with people, I see when they're, getting passionate about something that's purely for their own personal gain, you know, even if it's using their unique gifts and talents, it's completely different to when they switch that to um, a bigger picture where they're actually contributing to the world in some way positively. Mm. Like it completely changes and the, the motivation and the kind of the penny drops is such a beautiful mm. thing to see. It's really good. It is incredible. beautiful. That's a good word for it. It's beautiful. And I know just by way of contrast, I know somebody who is a very, very successful um, 
uh, businessman here. Yeah. I mean, multi, multi, multi. Um, he's possibly the most miserable person that I know. Um, <laughs> really? When you go, yeah, when you go out for a coffee together, which I rarely do nowadays, <laughs> you're always the one that pays the coffee. He can't even bring himself to buy you a cup of coffee. Oh, um, one of the meanest people that I know, um, he doesn't mean to be mean, but he just is, he can't help himself. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting when the view of is all about self and me versus the view about others. There's a, there's a fundamental shift that occurs. Yeah, and I love, in the book as well, you mentioned, I think it's in that moment where the Dalai Lama is talking to the life coach, he talks about, you know, <laughs> this personal development stuff is all very well, but what about other development? He gives it that term. Yeah. <clears throat> that's right. That's Sorry, I've got a bit of a throg in my throat. <clears throat> that's when we, we, instead of focusing on the self and the me and the I the whole time, well, let's think about focusing on other beings' welfare. Because one of the greatest paradoxes, and this is something Tibetan Buddhism is, is big on, one of the greatest paradoxes in the world is that um, if we want to be happy, the best way we can do it is to seek to give happiness to others. Yeah. Because we're the first beneficiaries when we do that. We might think, oh, um, I'm, you know, they're going to benefit, but I won't. But mm -hmm. if we think that, we're wrong. You know, we only need to try it and we'll find that it works. But whether it's generosity we're practicing or patience, um, or whatever it might be that we're kind of we're doing, um, if we can do it for the benefit of others, um, we find you know we we're, we're actually made so happy by whatever it is that we're doing, so we actually benefit from it directly. Yeah, and you see that, don't you? You look at any successful person from a wealth perspective and fame, if you like, perspective, they kind of get all of these you know shiny things that they wanted, and then they kind of realize oh. Um, it's not now? enough. And then you see them set up foundations and charities and start, you know, philanthropy and it's sort of Well, I'm profession. sure you've, you've probably in your programs, you've probably talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. um, which is basically, and anyone who's done psych at uni or anywhere would have come across it, where the base needs are clothing, shelter, food, etc. Those are things we need to survive physically. Mm -hmm. And then we go up to a need to belonging, etc. And the peak, the apex of it is self actualization, as Maslow would call it. Buddhists would call it enlightenment, but whatever you want to call it, yeah. it's basically uh, fulfilling your highest purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really uh, the name of the game. It's not all about acquisition of material stuff. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Dalai Lama, I think you know he's a wonderful example of, of a living, walking, breathing person who, if anyone's ever had the huge privilege of being in his presence, you're, it's almost like a force field of happiness that <laughs> kind of envelops everybody around him. I mean, when he came to Perth, I'll never forget, he came to this business lunch and we had 500 people in suits waiting for him. He walked up to the front of the room to give his address. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't, he doesn't just walk up like the aisle, he, like other people. He actually stops and, you know, and, and makes eye contact <laughs> with people. And there's this huge, great big man, six foot in his suit on his way up. And Dan Lama just reached out and he squeezed his arm. This guy just burst into tears. <gasps> Oh. It's just amazing. It makes me a bit tear up just remembering it. It's a, he has the most amazing effect on people. Um, and yet, you could say from a materialistic point of view, his life has been one of abject failure because he's the leader of Tibet. And yet, mm -hmm. Tibet's been invaded by the Chinese. They can't even live in their own country. They can't practice their own religion in their own country. Most of his people are in exile. On a weekly basis, we hear the most horrific stories coming out of Tibet. Um, the Dharma from, in Tibet has been kind of largely... Uh, destroyed, 90% of the monasteries are destroyed. However, it's the greatest gift to us in the West because we're benefiting from all these Tibetans in our midst and since the 1960s, you know, Tibetan Buddhism's life become quite big. Um, so it's kind of interesting, uh, in, you could, you know, in another person in the Dalai Lama's position could think how dreadful his life was. Um, but yeah. the Dalai Lama, of course, does not take that view at all, and fortunately. Um, and he's, he, to, to me, he's a great living example of, of his own uh, philosophy or of our philosophy. Yeah, and he has the best laugh ever. <laughs> like how, his laugh is just <laughs> incredible. Like I don't, I'm sure you've seen the move, the documentary Road to Peace. Um, I watched that quite recently. You know where they, it takes you through um, the Dalai Lama's journey when he was um, doing a tour, and his laugh, like you just cannot help but laugh with him when he laughs. It's just like the most contagious. Thing ever. It's just he, he wins over people. Even that um, Pierce, what's his name? Pierce Morgan, when he did yeah. his prog program and he went to America to start his show. And I thought, oh, gosh, this is going to be a difficult interview. And I was all kind of tense about it. But he had Pierce like, you know, melting by the end of it. <laughs>
Incredible. And I love, there's an analogy in the book that you use that I think is really great, um, which is where little snow lion is struggling with fur balls and she's, you know, gets really obsessed with grooming herself and ends up, um, you know, having to spit out these fur balls. So tell us about how that relates to... Well, I use the fur balls as an analogy um, because we all suffer from fur balls. Yeah. Um, fur balls being too much self-regarding, too much self-grooming, mm -hmm. too much concern about me, 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 me. It goes back to the same theme, really. Yeah. And, and we literally will make ourselves sick, you know, thinking about ourselves. I'm not sure whether you've ever had that experience of thinking, I'm sick of hearing and thinking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I just want out of here. And, you know, we spend so much of our life, you know, it's a fascinating study done recently with, with people using smartphones, smartphones, mm -hmm. and they were sent questions at different times of the day. What are you doing? What are you thinking? How happy are you? Mm -hmm. And it showed that half of the time, people are not thinking about what they're doing, they're thinking about something else. So we're in narrative mode. And yeah. also when we're thinking about something else, we're not likely to be happy. It's when we're thinking about what we're actually doing, we're far more likely to be happy. So the point is that um, a lot of the time we're in this narrative chatter, half of the time we're in a narrative mm -hmm. chatter, and most of that chatter is focused on me, 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 what I'm doing, what I'm about to have for breakfast, what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to be doing next. We have this need to almost like reassure ourselves that we actually exist, by kind of um, commenting, commenting or commentating, if you like, on our own activity and plans going forward. You know, I'm not disputing that we all need to have a proper plan in our lives and, on, you know, we need to be sensible. But a lot of the time it's just complete crap, you know, frankly. Uh, we don't need to be doing it. Um, and so we do make ourselves sick just thinking about ourselves. If only we were able to abide in the true nature of our own mind rather than this constant chatter, we would all be so much happier. And so I guess this is, a, this is the, the Furbles analogy is a way into that. To, instead of having this constant inner monologue and, and madness going on, um, just try and relax a bit. Try and create a bit more space in your life. I mean, so many people are really, really stressed out. It's like endemic in our society. And um, although people wouldn't thank you for saying it, a lot of it is actually self-induced. Um, it's not the actual things that people are having to deal with. It's the stress they put on themselves through this narrative chatter. And if only they could create a little less, a bit more space in their lives, that doesn't mean you have to go and sit on your bum for an hour on a meditation cushion. Yeah. It just means instead of having a coffee while checking through your Facebook account and while also making phone calls to people, just have a coffee. <laughs> just drink. When you're drinking coffee, drink coffee. You know, don't know. multitask. <laughs> they do all sorts of other things. We can create huge amounts of space in our lives without actually changing what we do. It's just changing the way we do it and being, being more mindful, if you like. Yeah, and there's a beautiful moment in the book that demonstrates that perfectly where Snow Lion is in Frank's Cafe, which is a cafe a little bit down the road from um, His Holiness's residence where she lives, and she's observing how people are eating in the cafe. And I love the way that you describe it and that you know she's sitting there got, sort of looking at them they're spending all of this money, there's all these elaborate preparations about this, you know, beautiful food and yet they it's as if they do not know how to eat. That's I think the words that you use. And I just love Yeah. That. Well, she's comparing it to what she sees up the road five minutes away in Namgyal Monastery, where the monks have the very, very austere diet by comparison. Uh, maybe one or two you know, seasoning herbs in a bowl of soup or what have you, mm -hmm. and yet they eat their food with great relish and in quietness and uh, really enjoying it and really, when they're eating soup, they're eating soup and, or drinking soup, whatever you do with soup, but they're basically um, uh, being in the moment and enjoying it for what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you, by contrast, you have people who have far more, as you say, elaborately prepared food who basically aren't actually eating it. They, they taste the first mouthful. And we're all guilty of this, you know, I'm me included. We have the first mouth thing, mm, this is nice, and then we're away. We're talking to somebody or we're reading a newspaper or on the iPad or whatever it is, and when we're eating the food, we're not eating the food. You think, well, why did I just spend 40 bucks on a main <laughs> when in fact I've only eaten $5 worth and the other $35 I've sort of processed without being very conscious of the fact. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense on any level. That's so true, and I'm so guilty of that. That's one of my biggest things. And, you know, I I look at food; it's like fuel, kind of. You know, fill up the tank, and then off I go. I'll even I eat standing up sometimes. That's probably terrible. You know, I won't even leave the kitchen. I'll be <laughs> <laughs> I'll be at the side. You know, getting it out of the way. But yeah, it's something that I really need to work on. And I did that this morning actually. I kind of I I was, you know, rushing getting my breakfast ready for our interview, and I thought, okay, sit down. Just eat, taste the food, be mindful, you know, try and... It's recommended um, by various people that you should 
try and have at least one mindful meal a week where literally you, um, even if you're on your own, whether you're married or have a partner or whatever, it doesn't matter, but where one meal you simply eat the meal when you're eating the meal. You don't have any background music. You don't have, you just literally focus on the, pro, the, the, the sensation of eating that meal. Yeah. Interesting. It's very interesting. I'm going to try that one. It's, that's on my list of things to do. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, you know, you're creating space in your life. Yeah. And there's so much stimulation. It's, the world really needs some space right now, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's more and more research showing that the impact of mobile devices is having on our attention span and it's incredibly poor, you know, incredibly mm. bad in the sense that people are becoming more and more um, incapable of remembering things, of absorbing things when they read them, uh, and of concentrating on things. Uh, and so really, uh, you know, our, we're almost degrading our human intelligence by mm. having such a fragmented mind. That's very true. I, mm. I actually have to switch, you know, I switch off social media now for portions of the day because it's just too much having it on, you know, beeping and it makes that noise. <laughs> at you all day long. It's like we need to. We need to. We all need to etox quite regularly. Um, oh yeah. Whether it's uh, you know curfew at nine nine p.m. curfew, stop stop doing stuff online after nine p.m. Or whether you so like every weekend, I try and have one day a week where I don't actually open a computer or a laptop or anything. I just mm. for that day, I'm just doing stuff and I'm with friends or I'm meditating or whatever. But I'm not online. Yeah, I think that's a great great piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, one of the things that I'm passionate as a, about is, um, you know, taking knowledge and insights and wisdom, but sort of pairing that with action, because obviously, you know, how useful is a piece of knowledge if you're not implementing it into your life? And making Absolutely. Changes. Yeah, and that's sort yeah. of what Simple Life Strategy is all about. So I'd love to hear from you, I guess, maybe from the perspective of little HHC or Snow Lion and her journey. Um, what, what can people do immediately, like maybe even today? Um, to start making their lives a little easier? Well, going back to what we were just talking about, I think one very simple thing to do is, um, anybody can do this, is mm -hmm. to assign in your own mind some activity that you find inher inherently quite pleasurable, yeah. typically buying a nice barista-made coffee, yeah. uh, skinny flat white or a long <laughs> black mac or long mac or whatever it might be. Um, but this, uh, say, saying to yourself, every time I drink one of those, I'm going to drink it mindfully. I'm not going to um, check my social media while doing it. I'm not going to uh, be reading a newspaper or whatever. Or even if you do read a newspaper while also enjoying a skinny flat white, at the moment, for the, for the moment that you actually pick the cup up, mm -hmm. drink, the, drink the liquid, feel it going down, be focused purely and completely on that. You know, then you yeah. can put your attention back on the newspaper or whatever. But just be mindfully sip every sip of that mm -hmm. cup of coffee or mindfully eat every mouthful of that meal or mindfully do something. And Or you might say, well, hang on, I'm going to um, be mindful every time I get from the station and I have to walk 10 minutes to work. I'm going to be mindful. I'm not going to be like you see these people walking down the <laughs> pavement hunched over their <laughs> mobile devices. They're, they're not sort of vaguely aware of that, but, you know, it's – kind of sad. Um, uh, on the most beautiful day, sometimes the sky is blue, the sun is shining, the birds are singing and completely oblivious mm -hmm. and instead they're, they're online. But try and just do a few things mindfully and I think people will find that they create a lot more space in their day by doing that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it can have an amazing sense of well-being, um, just our sense, old sense of peacefulness and well-being. Um, if we can do that a little bit a little bit, a little bit. And then you might find that you actually want to do more like that and more and more and more until the objective, of course, is that your whole life should be lived mindfully. Yeah. I think and we can, see the, we can see the result of that from people like the Dalai Lama who, you know, mm -hmm. just seems to relish every moment. Yeah, that's a really great piece of advice. Thank you for that. And so where can people pick up a copy of your book? Look, I've got my little notes in here. Um, well, <laughs> uh, if it's not in your bookstore, it's certainly readily available from any of the normal online um, yeah. booksellers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So all the usual ones. Um, and yeah, uh, if you want to read the first chapter, mm -hmm. um, people can come free of charge. People can come to my website, which is just davidmickey.com. Yeah. That's M-I-C-H-I-E, but it's a Scottish name, davidmickey.com. And you can read the first chapter there. So try before you buy. Okay, great. Well, I highly recommend everyone goes over there and gets that free chapter because I really, really, really enjoyed 
your book and I think it's such a beautiful light-hearted look at you know some really quite profound Buddhist principles that's what I sort of loved about it the most it's quite a fresh way of um, looking at you know those timeless principles that are so valuable and so thank you so much for um, yeah for your time today but also for taking the time to put together this book and for sharing that message with the world because it's a really important one. Super. Thank you very much, Zane. Thanks for having me on your program. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone at home, for watching. Um, I guess one of the core messages from this book today is about how, you know, helping others is actually really um, how we're going to experience true happiness. So I'd love to hear what your experiences have been um, with helping others. How did that make you feel? So if you can leave a comment beneath the video, that would be great. Or you can head over to simplelifestrategies.com and leave a comment there. If you'd like to receive free inspired tips uh, on living each week, then you can also head over to simplelifestrategies.com. And if this video inspired you, or if you're just crazy about cats or the Dalai Lama, then please do share this with your friends and family so that they get to share the love too. So thanks again for watching everyone. This is Simple Life Strategies TV and I'm Zoe B. I'll catch you next time.